All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast. BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. One subject that we had never mentioned before is 419 scamming, advanced fee fraud. The concept of giving money to somebody over the internet for unreturned promises, and that's just how it's evolved into in the uh, 21st century. Some people would say that it goes back to the 1950s. Some people would say that it goes back to the 1920s. Some people say that it goes back even older than that, depending on what source you're going to look at. This is a very, very old-fashioned scam that has been re- reinvigorated in the 21st century. And one of the places where it has really taken off is West Africa. It is most commonly associated with the nation of Nigeria, like saying that we have an enormous amount of money that's left from one of your dead relatives, and please pay a fine so you can obtain this massive fortune. But it's a total hoax, of course. And then you also have the other variants about maybe something that is a little more technical. Like someone will be saying, like, hey, I'm a scientist and I'm working on this research project. There was something called the robotic tractor scam where somebody says that they're a scientist and they're, like, trying to build this sort of robotic tractor device. But they need just a little bit more money because they lost their funding. It can be a, it can be fashioned in a variety of ways. But, um, it's as we said, it's mostly associated with Nigeria. But Ghana really became sort of a hotbed for 419 scamming, advanced fee fraud. And uh, 419 is, is, of course, the uh, Nigerian legal code number that deals with this specific crime. Like, on in their penal code, it's like the number 419 is how they identify it. But yes, this expanded into Benin and Senegal as well. As well as, um, there was even a report once that many people from Zimbabwe were actually masquerading as Nigerians and Ghanaians just so they could participate in the, in the, in the scams. And this grew to be so big that by 2010, scamming was the third largest industry in Nigeria. And when you actually think about it, as a third world nation, that isn't that outrageous. When you would have ordinary citizens who would be able to obtain millions of dollars, I mean millions with a capital M, it's not so crazy to think that scamming was the third largest industry in a nation of 150 million people. It's like, goodness gracious, how does this happen and what is the response? This was an issue that I really tackled about uh, eight years ago. You know, like when you're kind of in your early 20s, you think about a lot of things about where's the future going to go? What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do once you're kind of just out of college and like, holy crap, you know, you actually have to tackle the world. One of the things that I had been thinking about was pursuing this specific issue and just kind of, I really thought we needed sort of a foundation specifically devoted to targeting advanced fee fraud and uh, 419 scamming because I felt that the response from the international community was rather one of blaming the victim as opposed to blaming the criminal. And we'll say a few things about that in a second, but um, one of the things was if you were to create any sort of foundation, the sort of plan was to really focus on how to help the people who are getting caught up in this. Because as we said, blaming the victim as opposed to the criminal. So many people say that they don't feel sorry for the victims. So many people say that they don't feel sorry for someone for giving, you know, $100,000 to the Nigerians. They just say, I don't feel anything for you. If you are dumb enough to fall for it, you deserve to get caught. And that was a big issue that I took exception with. Because I was just like, that's not acceptable. They are not the criminals. They shouldn't be giving their money away to... um people that they've never met before over the internet for things like, oh, well, maybe my dead relative did die in Ghana and I do have $2 million waiting for me. Or, oh, why don't I just give this person that I don't really know thousands of dollars so they can build a robotic tractor when you don't actually know who the person is and you've never met them before. But it's like, I don't really think that those are advisable things to do. But you have to recognize that these people are deceived just like anybody else. And you see this very clearly when you listen to the stories of the people who get fooled by 419 scammers. They are doctors. They are professionals. They are CEOs. I mean, you'll see some of those sometimes. And one of the hardest ones to deal with is the people who are 
just really lonely and not and like romance scammers. And this is the way that a lot of uh, things that um, I'd say that I guess I had a little bit more interaction with took on because you could actually talk to them on on just like websites. It's not even really dating sites. I didn't really do any of that because <laughs> not to give too much background. Yeah, I was too more of just a more of just a lone star back in those days. Ha. No, but um, on like inter internet media sites like Interpals and Skyrock.com, or just to name a few, you could actually you know just like get loads of messages coming in from people on social media and a little bit on Facebook, but mostly like I said, Interpals and Skyrock about people talking about they just need money. You know, it's like hey, I want to be your girlfriend, but you have to support me. Things like that, and it's like it's totally fake. It still would be classified as fraud or scamming because they are lying. And those are just people who are preying off the lonely and the vulnerable, and they're turning them into victims. I do have to emphasize someone is a victim if they have been deceived by the scammers. Deception does not have any sort of boundary when it comes to IQ points or education or professional background. Anybody can be deceived. And the scammers are very well aware of that. So that's like the kind of side of the story that I really felt was being heavily neglected by the activists. So many things are more just like, I mean, they want to shut down the kind of cyber cafes where the West Africans would be running their scam operations. Because what is very typical is they form into kind of what are called gangs. Except, you know, they're not, like, out on the streets fighting for territory. They just unify together with a bunch of computers linked together. And they just, you know, spend months on end trying to hook one person in. I mean, that's sort of the way they describe the lifestyle of a 419 scammer in West Africa. It would be like, you spend uh, maybe three months before you actually get someone to send you money. And, um, I mean, so, like, the guys confess about it. I mean, that's just what the way, one of the ways that they go about these things and once you get a person in you try to hold them as long as possible and the dr phil show started doing a, a couple exposés on this and i mean you just hear people giving seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to the people on the internet a hundred thousand dollars to people on the internet over a million in one case someone gave over a million dollars to um you know just someone that they had uh, never met before and you when you look at the kind of examples of things like that you just sort of see that I mean, they're just playing off a person's vulnerable emotional state at that point about someone who is just kind of so lonely and just caught up in that that they're going to fall for any sort of romantic trick that can be pulling them in. But you also get kind of one of the things that is very seldom talked about is, is that people just don't know what else to do. I mean, you can't go to the authorities to get your money back. That is one of the biggest like advertisements that people were trying to put out when it comes to fighting back against advanced fee fraud about fighting back against 419 scamming they're like if you give any money to someone overseas you will never get it back there is no sort of reimbursement fund there is no sort of like kind of repatriation of funds you cannot get it back it's not like in america and like you know you have a you have a dispute on paypal or something ebay and something like that and, and you call up the customer service line and you say hey they sold me a fraudulent product I mean, you can do that with things like Amazon.com. Hey, I bought something, and it's not what they said it was. And then, you know, it's like they can resolve that dispute, and you can get your money back. When you're just sending things to people in West Africa, as well as other parts of the world, it's, it was a very big thing in Russia for a time being as well, this kind of very similar thing, the romance scams and such. You cannot get your money back, and that's the biggest advertisement that you can put out there. If you send any money overseas to someone that you don't really know that well, especially somebody that you've never met before, it's gone. There is no sort of like um, reimbursement fund or anything like that. But at the same time, though, people aren't really listening. And one of the things that people were also noticing is that, I mean, so a lot of kind of experts were sort of saying that the authorities are losing the fight against the 419 West African scammers. And just 419 scamming in general, it's just a growing industry. And one woman from Ghana, at least claiming to be from Ghana, wrote me and said just, ha, 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 you talk all you want, but you Americans give more and more. And then she also invited me to join her scamming gang. I mean, people say some silly things, but, you know, it's like 
You just see the silliest profiles about someone with, you know, like, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman who writes in broken, horrible Ghanaian English is just saying, I'm stuck in Ghana, please give me money, and people are actually falling for that. But the fact of the matter is, people are. Why do the scammers present their ideas in the way that they do? Why do so many of them kind of do that? They put up a picture of a blonde-haired woman in Nigeria or Ghana, and then they say that they are just on a business trip or that they are lost and stuck in a hotel and you have to pay the bills so that they can leave. And then once they leave, they'll come and find you. How, why are they presenting themselves like that? Why are they putting in such little effort? Well, there are two big reasons for that. The first one is the average person will not fall for a scam. The average person is going to be like, no, you're trying to get money out of me. And then they kind of need to weed out the per single person who is actually likely to fall for it. They need to find the person who is just more gullible. So it's one of the ways to do that. It kind of weeds out the person who is more likely to fall for that. If they fall for this, they'll fall for anything, that sort of mentality. So that's one of the reasons why they put in such, such a little amount of effort. And it's also, I mean, just about kind of attracting in more people. It makes it so blatantly obvious in the second biggest thing is that it puts someone in a false sense of security. The most of most of the people in the world are just going to be looking at them and be like, "Oh, this person seems so dumb. There's no way that they could deceive me." I kid you not. This is the thought process that is going on behind them. So it's like it's two levels of deception. One making you think that the person is harmless and the other one is kind of trying to weed out a person who is going to be more likely to give money. So when it comes to kind of tackling the strategy associated with Nigerian 419 scamming, as well as Ghanaian, I just, I'm, it's such a habit for me to say West African scamming, Nigerian scamming, but I'm fully well aware that this is something that kind of branches out all over the world. It just really takes different forms and comes in different ways. It's like um, someone actually did a report on this. It was a Nigerian American girl on YouTube was talking about how only 7% of the scams in the world come from Nigeria. 66% of online scamming is actually done in through the United States. I mean, I don't really know if they're accounting for things like VPNs and, you know, virtual private network trafficking and stuff like that where a person could actually be in another place. I don't really know. That's just some girl on YouTube talking the same way that I'm talking to you right now. But um, it's some, definitely something to always bear in mind that these things exist outside of West Africa. It's just that they are rather, it's just a very, very kind of blatantly obvious attempt with the West African scams that they are fake. It's so obvious that they are fake and they come up with them very twisted and silly plot lines. And for a while, scam baiting, as I mentioned, I used to do some of that. Scam baiting was really kind of going out of control. And it was uh, something that was one of the only lines of defense. I mean, about how, do, how would you stop the scammers? is by having people in the Western world just keeping them engaged so that they would not be talking to other people. And scam baiting, of course, is just that you're kind of pranking the cyber scammers. And yes, it's sort of just like that. Like you're just kind of like doing silly things to them so that they are engaged and they won't be able to talk to anyone else. And there was this one guy named Anthony who used to have a website called teletorture.com. And he would do things like he would convince people that he would send them computers if they paid the shipping. But then he would just send boxes of rocks and blocks of wood and stuff. You know, things that would cost thousands of dollars in shipping. And it was one of the ways to target the scam industry. I mean, because it is an illegal thing. If we're going to say scamming is the third largest in industry in Nigeria by 2010, it's an illegal industry. It's corrupt. It is immoral. It is wrong. And the blame should be put on the vic on the perpetrators, not the victims. The blame should be put on those who are doing the illegal action. And this is one of the biggest things that I notice in our culture when everyone's just like, blame the victim. It's their fault for get being deceived. Anybody can be de deceived. You can be deceived. I can be deceived. And we can also be manipulated. Who has not been lied to in our lives? And we thought the person was telling the truth, but they were lying. Who has not had that experience? So I am very reluctant to blame the victims. Even if it is something crazy, when this blonde-haired girl in Nigeria is saying that she's a bank manager and she has a loan project that she wants to pull you into, 
I don't care. I'm not blaming the victim. I'm not encouraging that type of behavior. I'm not encouraging people to send their money overseas to strangers that they don't even know. But you don't blame the victim. It, when it comes to a crime, you blame the criminal, especially when it's unwarranted. This isn't some case where there's this giant gray area, well, who threw the first punch? No, these people are trying to make a livelihood out of ripping other people off, about bankrupting other people and ruining their lives. Let's focus on the problem. And one of the ways that I thought about going about this back when we could actually talk, back in, you know, like when I talked about kind of viewing this in my early 20s, it was just sort of like education. The only way to go about this is education, educating people in America and other parts of the country about just ways to um, recognize the signs of a scammer, but um, recognize just when something is most likely fake and also just having better access to the databases that we have. Like if you Google someone's email address, they can most likely come up on a scam database. And that was one of the things that they were putting out there. It's like if you ever get a suspicious email and you want to know if it's real or fake, you can Google them and you will see that you can Google the email address, yada, 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 at gmail.com, blank, at yahoo.com, and you can see whether or not they are on a list of scamming databases. And you know, it's also like as people send you kind of awkward English messages, you can copy and paste the whole thing, put that into Google, and see if that is a template that is used by other scammers, because a lot of them don't really write their own material. And that's calculated. It's not like people are lazy and silly and they don't know how to write. No, it's very calculated. Once again, puts people in a false sense of security, and it also makes the other person think that they are less threatening by putting out that sort of awkward English type. So that's kind of at the point where we are now, and education would still be the way forward. Also, things are things like Facebook need just to have better security in general. You need to just be able to report pe people's profiles more quickly. And we mentioned those other websites, Interpals and Skyrock. I used to think that they had some better ways of reporting scammers, especially Interpals. It was like you could um, just report someone and it would go under review immediately. You don't have to fill out three pages of forms like other social media sites. And it needs to be a quick, effortless process to report people. Also, Yahoo.com needed to have a better sort of security system where you can report suspicious activity and they can get their email accounts deleted such as, you know, like committing advance fee fraud. And the biggest thing to remember is, and I know anyone who's going to be listening to this is probably very well aware, but if somebody asks for money online, it's a scam. If somebody asks for money online, it's a scam. There used to be this TV show called Crime Watch from Singapore. I mean, there's, of course, Crime Watch UK, but Crime Watch Singapore was a very kind of well-done crime show because I really liked how... It was both, you know, like entertaining television, but also super educational. And there are a lot of variants of Crime Watch, but I hadn't seen one just like that. And they told a story about a woman who thought she was giving money to a man in England, but the computer was actually coming from Nigeria. And one of the reasons she kept giving money is she didn't have another way to get the money back. And that ties back to what we said at the beginning about how if you give the money overseas, there's no, like reimbursement fund you're not going to get your money repatriated and that was the only thing that she could possibly think of this is her only option so once you fall in once somebody falls in once any person falls into these kind of 419 scamming traps there's no way out there's really no way out but like um this is also taking very uh, different shapes as i mentioned one of the things on dr phil was one woman actually met up with the guy and like he was living in Niger in Malaysia and then he moved back to Nigeria, but she would just visit him frequently and they had an ongoing relationship. They got married, but he wouldn't come to America. In short, yes, she's giving him all the money, but they're in a real relationship. They got married, but it's just he's just calling her his ATM machine on social media. You know, it's just like these scams take very different forms and you really have to wonder about what's going to happen next. But once again, it's like... It's not really going to know any limits. One of the things is just you're going to have to we're, we are going to have to use education as a way to combat this type of illegal activity. And one of the first things that we can do is get rid of the blame game for the victims, put the blame on the criminals, people who are using deceptive tactics for profit because 
it's the only way that they think that they can make money and also something to do with greed so anyway that's kind of where we are now that's all for me what do you think about anything associated with 419 scamming do you have any stories about this and i would love to hear from you until next time